Good afternoon and welcome to the AgriBility webinar series. Today we're going to be talking about hand controls for agricultural users. This is actually the third webinar in the AgriBility webinar series. The first two uh, involved self-employment for people with disabilities and then uh, relationships between uh, VR, vocational rehabilitation agencies, and AgriBility. If you weren't able to attend those, they, those are archived at www.agribility.org and you'll be able to view those there along with today's presentation. Our presenter today is Rob Stuthridge. He is an ergonomist and also a member of the National AgriBility Project team here at Purdue University. For those who are not uh, familiar with AgriBility, it's a USDA sponsored program that focuses on assisting agricultural workers with disabilities. And again, if you go to the www.agribility.org website, you'll be able to find out more about the program. Before I turn things over to Rob, I would like to give you just a few basic webinar instructions. First of all, of course, you will need speakers or headphones to hear the presentation today. Also, if you would like to go to the meeting menu, which is in the top left of your screen, you will be able to manage your settings and you might want to check your connection speed. Again, dial-up connections are not recommended because of the uh, bandwidth required for this type of presentation. At the end of the presentation, there will be uh, an 800 number if you would like to call in to ask your questions verbally. Otherwise, you may use the chat window, which is located on the bottom left of your screen. <clears throat> now, if you uh, simply type your question into the, um, the bar at the bottom and hit the arrow. Uh, we will receive your questions and we will archive those for the end of the presentation. We will also uh, have four quick survey questions at the end. If you would be so kind as to fill those out, they're just basic information uh, about uh, your participation in the webinar. <clears throat> also, um, if you have any problems, technical problems with the webinar, please go ahead and uh, enter that into the chat window, your questions about that into the chat window. And also, um, you may uh, email raz, R-A-C-Z, at purdue.edu if you're having difficulty using the chat window. I'd like now, I'd like now to turn it over to Rob Stuthridge, and uh, he will give our presentation. At the end, he'll turn it back over to me for question and answer period. So I will turn it over to Rob. Thanks, Paul. The, uh, the main aim of this presentation is to raise awareness of injury risks that can arise from the use of assistive technology in the form of hand controls. Uh, now, these risks may affect not only the intended user, um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm just going to move on to uh, <laughs> the opening, opening slide. Uh, the intended user, uh, but also uh, others whose needs may not be adequately considered when designing assistive technology hand controls. The risks associated with AT hand controls are not discernible using just common sense alone, and that therefore they're quite likely to be overlooked. However, these risks where identified are not difficult to reduce or even eliminate. So we hope that this presentation will provide a useful primer for anyone that's designing and evaluating AT hand controls. Um, I have lost everything here. Just bear with me a second, people, while I get some images back. Uh, there you go. Okay, I'm back with you now. We've provided a list of references in advance of the presentation, uh, together with a link to the tool, the Quick Exposure Check tool, which will be introduced towards the end of the webinar. 
And the agenda for the event shows that we're going to start by looking at some examples of hand controls. So we'll discuss the need for those controls and then consider some of the hazards arising from their design and use. Finally, we'll look at the assessment of ergonomic risks relating to the use of hand controls. Here, you can see that access to the cab is enabled using an operator's seat maneuvered using a hydraulic boom arm. Once seated, the operator has lever extensions for actuation of the brakes and clutch, and I've ringed those in yellow. In this example, a pedal extension is clamped to the brake pedal shaft on a compact tractor and a cruise control has been piggybacked onto the same extension shaft. I'm not going to stop and discuss these in any detail because we're going to get to uh, more general uh, design issues as we go through. These are some examples of, of on the left you can see uh, fairly simple clamped brake pedal extensions fitted to a tractor and a slightly more complex push-pull brake and accelerator hand control that's fitted to a farm utility vehicle on the right. The decision whether to have a bend or a crank in the extension lever of an AT hand control has got to be based both on safety and ergonomic considerations. Each of these designs could be improved by the application of ergonomics principles which relate to optimum hand and wrist or, and forearm posture for the application of pulling and pushing postures. In the left hand image, the clutch lever could restrict access to or egress from the cab area in this position. The angle of the handle may not be ideal in terms of wrist and arm postures either. A possible alternative solution, and it's a complicated one here, is shown superimposed. The lever in the right hand image has a horizontal rather than a vertical grip, and it's worth noting that maximum push and pull forces are higher when using a vertical handle rather than a horizontal one. There's also a very long reach to the control in that particular circumstance, although in its favor it doesn't block access to and from the cab. One solution to the left hand um, image there might be instead of thinking of uh, a mechanical lever you might actually want to consider using some other kind of, of actuation system like uh, hydraulics or an electric uh, actuator. Having to perform a greater number of tasks using the hands may mean thinking about ways that we can overuse, uh, reduce overuse risk being able to lock controls such as with the clutch lever on the left or to use one hand instead of two for example when steering may be very helpful to the operator. I want to consider next the likely demand for this type of technology in the form of hand controls in agricultural settings. Well we know that within the the agricultural occupational sector demand is likely to be significantly higher than we would expect in the general working population. In the United States agriculture suffers from a higher than average rate of permanent disability. This sector typically underreports health problems and has a tendency to be quite stoical about getting on with tasks in spite of any physical barriers. What some people regard as an inconvenience others may define as a disability. For these reasons, accurate information on the prevalence of disability is quite elusive for this sector. However, in terms of the types of disabilities that seek help through agribility, we have something here um, from just from a few years back which suggests that about 23% are orthopedic disorders, including musculoskeletal, arthritis, those kind of issues. 16% referred with amputations. 13% with neuromuscular disorders, 21% with spinal cord injuries, and 27% was a mixture of others including head injuries, that kind of thing. Now those figures are obviously not a reflection of the relative proportions of those disabilities in the agricultural workforce. But any, any of those kinds of disability may involve reduced lower limb functionality that necessitates the use of hand controls to supplement foot controls. It's estimated that over 70% of agricultural workers with disabilities continue to work by modifying their work environment using assistive technology devices of various kinds, including aids to access buildings and vehicles, aids to mobility, and aids to operate equipment. AT, of course, includes not only the devices and modifications, 
but also the guidance services that are provided by professionals which help in the design, selection and provision of assistive technology devices. It's been shown that AT may increase the primary user's risk of developing secondary injuries as a consequence of the inappropriate design of the AT which can give rise to slips, trips, falls and incidental contact with the AT. AT may also increase the risk of injuries from similar causes for secondary users including family members and other employed workers including seasonal and casual labour. Slips, falls and incidental contact result in acute injury. In these cases it's usually possible to attribute the the outcome, the injury, to an immediately precedent event or series of events. And knowing that the AT is a cause of injury may result in a redesign of the AT, it may result in a limitation or a cessation of its use, and it could result in a change in workers' behaviour when using the AT. But most agricultural injuries are not acute. Work-related musculoskeletal disorders are the most prevalent form of injury in this sector and the largest potential source of disability affecting agricultural workers. Typically, work-related musculoskeletal disorders exhibit no obvious cause-effect relationship between an incident and an injury. And as in other sectors, these disorders arise in agriculture mainly through repeated or prolonged exposure to hazards such as whole body and segmental vibration, uh, including uh, hand-arm vibration, for example, awkward working postures, and the use of excessive force. So it's sensible to consider how AT hand controls might influence the risk for these types of disorders. Well, firstly, it's worth noting that there are no specific current ergonomic standards for the design of AT hand controls whether in agriculture or in any other setting. Uh, general guidelines do exist for hand controls on agricultural equipment such as ASABE S3354 operator controls on agricultural equipment and ASABE EP4431 relating to the color coding of hand controls. And further insight, though not related specifically to agriculture, can be gained from looking at the standards devised by the Society of Automotive Engineers. The location of hand controls affects both posture and the maximum force available for operating the control. As a general rule, hand controls should be located where they can be easily reached and where maximum force can be applied. In general, this is between elbow and shoulder height, in front of the operating shoulder, and between 16 and 28 inches from a vertical plane measured at the operator's back. Operating the control should not induce flexed or rotated trunk postures, by flexed I mean bending forwards, which would indicate that the control is too far away or offset too far to the right or left of the operator it shouldn't cause shoulder hyperextension in which the elbow projects to the rear of the operator's trunk this would indicate that the control is too close and on the the drawing here you'll see that indicated by the dashed line where the elbow projects uh, past the vertical reference point pushing is most efficient when starting close to the torso maximum push force should be no more and this is an absolute maximum, than two-thirds of the maximum force available to the weakest operator. And pulling strength is greatest from close to the maximum reach distance. The maximum pull force, again, should be no more than two-thirds the maximum of the weakest operator. Now this raises some issues. Most assistive technology is based on an ergonomics for one approach in this sense the design is focused solely or primarily on meeting the needs of a worker with a disability but agricultural workforces are often highly variable they include children youths older workers females males including workers with existing injuries or disabilities 
what if the modified equipment will be used by these people? Is it safe for them also? What is the impact of the AT on their posture? What is their maximum grip diameter, pull force, push force and so on? We really need to start by defining actual users of the control in order to ensure that AT doesn't exceed their capacity and cause them injury. These secondary users may in fact provide the design parameters for the hand control. Therefore, we need to identify actual or potential users and to be knowledgeable about how specific human factors such as body segment dimensions, maximum forces, etc influence AT design. For example, there is some evidence that both the operating forces and reach distances required to actuate tractor levers and controls may exceed the capacity of young operators. And in the case of these two studies, the operators that were taken into account were aged between 13 and 17 years and 12 and 16 years respectively. AT falls somewhere along a continuum between exclusive and universal design. The more AT is designed from an ergonomics for one perspective, the greater the risk that it will not meet the needs of multiple users, and the greater the likelihood that users must adapt to operate the modified equipment. The decision regarding where to locate the AT along the continuum will be influenced by economic and operational factors. If the modification will never be used by more than the client with a disability, then exclusive design, that is ergonomics for one, is going to be fine. It's also fine if the item is of such low cost that other users may each be provided with unmodified versions of the equipment. But with increasing intensiveness in the use of the equipment, for example, the round-the-clock use of harvesters at certain times of the year, and increasing capital cost, the high cost of tractors, ATVs, and so on, shared use may be not only desirable, but essential. In such cases, the possible impact on other operators must be taken into account when designing AT, including hand controls. Now this webinar can't provide every single detail relating to the design parameters of AT hand controls in the time that we have available, but we can give a few pointers which are consistent with the comments on exclusive and universal design. Well firstly, the maximum distance to a control should not exceed the shortest reach among actual users with the seat optimally positioned. Or if you don't have that information, you could base that on the 5th percentile adult female reach if uh, no children are going to be using that. If you or children are going to use the control, then use the female 5th percentile reach data for the appropriate age group. You'll need to look up anthropometry tables for those dimensions if you don't have them. So these are cases where we don't necessarily know uh, the users. But to reduce fatigue, frequently operated controls should be brought closer than the maximum reach distance without forcing the shoulder to hyperextend as the control is brought to its closest operating position. The impact of vibration on the spine is greater where the spine is in a non-neutral posture. Twisting or rotating the spine or bending forwards or sideways with a loss of back support in particular, for example when reaching to or maintaining a grip on the hand controls, will tend to amplify the effect on the spine of whole body vibration. If the legs are not used to assist by bracing against trunk movements, energy may be transferred to the muscles and joints of the upper limbs via increased grip force and increased contraction of upper limb muscles during trunk stabilization. So we need to ensure that adequate trunk stabilization doesn't rely on upper limb energy transfer. You might consider, for example, using armrests to stabilize or changing the seat angle, using torso belts, harnesses, seating positioners, etc. It's essential that operators are able to grasp fully the handle of a lever type control. 
This means allowing enough space around it for the user to grasp and operate the control without interference from adjacent controls or surfaces. Allow at least a two inch gap and preferably more between adjacent lever handles to allow for the thickness of the 95th percentile adult male hand wearing heavy gloves. Insufficient clearance may mean that users do not properly grasp the control which will reduce the maximum force at their disposal. Capacity, our capacity for force and the application for force is also reduced by not having a control which is sorry by having a control which is either too thick or where the, the grip surface is sharp or hot or cold uh, somehow uh, reducing our capacity for applying uh, force and for holding that control comfortably. If the control is made of metal, a rounded padded grip will, inf it will improve force capacity provided it is of a suitable diameter or span for the user's hand. Never use grips with finger detents, the kind of little wavy things that your fingers are supposed to fit into. They fit uh, a relatively small number of people and they may be more uncomfortable for other users than just going with a plain foam handle. Optimal handle span is dependent on hand length. Measuring from the heel of the hand to the tip of the longest finger, a small to medium hand from 6.7 to 7.5 inches in length can apply greatest grip force to a handle up to 2 inches in span. Larger hands, greater than 7.5 inches long, are better suited by a handle slightly larger, say around 2.4 inches in span. Additional layers of padding material may be added as necessary, so slip over grips could be used to increase span for large handed users and removed for smaller or medium handed users. By the way, there's no evidence that foam or gel padding applied to grips or gloves will reduce the actual energy transferred to the hand and arm during vibration. When deciding how to shape and locate hand controls, particularly the lever types, we need to exercise care to avoid blocking emergency access and egress routes for the operator. ASAB standard S383 rollover protective structures for wheeled agricultural tractors requires two unrestricted exits from the tractor cab. Thus, hand control must not block either of these exits. We can refer back to this earlier visual example of a clutch lever that appears to restrict accessibility to the driver position, which may again justify finding an alternative route or an alternative means of actuating the clutch. So, what happens when an AT hand control is not optimally designed for a user or group of users? Well, it may result in a need to alter the design of the control. It may lead to the restriction of specific users uh, in terms of operating the equipment, maybe uh, reducing the uh, duration which the, the equipment can be used. And a failure to make such accommodations can increase the risk of injury for users. Making those accommodations, on the other hand, may increase costs or reduce productivity in the short term. For those reasons, we need to take into account the needs of all users when we're actually designing hand controls. This really starts by identifying the users. If the users are known, we can take, obviously, direct measurements of critical dimensions. If only a generic user is available or known, try to obtain a best guess of their likely demographics. For example, are they going to be adults? Are they going to be males, a mixture of males and females? What kind of age range are they going to be in? And that would allow the use of appropriate anthropometric or body measurement tables. If the users are not at all definable, assume that these will range in age from the minimum legally permissible to use the modified equipment up to, let's say, you might choose 70 years, you may choose 75 years, but you would have a rationale for, for selecting that age range. And you also need to include both the fifth percentile, particularly female, um, but if it's uh, an entirely male uh, user group, then go with the fifth percentile male, and the 95th percentile males for all age groups. 
The following anthropometric dimensions are critical to determining the location and operating forces for hand controls. Maximum forward reach grip at the shoulder with elbow straight or extended should be based on the user with the shortest reach. You don't actually want to locate the control right at that maximum distance unless it is rarely used. For frequently used controls, bring the control as far within this distance as you can, but obviously allowing for safety. The forward reach grip at elbow height with the elbow flexed at 90 degrees uh, should be based on the, the longest or the 95th percentile elbow grip length without shoulder extension is the minimum distance for controls. So just bending your elbow and with the forearm horizontal that's really going to be your starting point for your control and you really don't want it coming any closer when you're actuating it than that otherwise you're going to go into shoulder hyperextension. Consider hand length which we've already covered. Aim ideally for less than a third and never more than two thirds of the maximum force of the weakest user to operate the control. And I'm going to put some figures onto those when we get into the the uh, the exposure um, the exposure check tool in a few minutes. The forces must be further reduced for suboptimal postures. So if the postures are really uh, not too good when using the control, or if they're compromised in any way, or where the application of force is frequent repetitive or sustained for say more than six seconds at a time. Now to help with this a little bit you might want to turn to using something like a standard posture evaluation tool and these can be used both during the design stage or the fitting stage. The fitting stage these might be useful if you've got on-site fabrication or adjustments um, that can be made. And the quick exposure check, which is, is one that I'm uh, particularly familiar with, uh, is useful for assessing musculoskeletal risk from the use of things like AT hand controls. The questionnaire, which is available online free of charge, uh, covers posture, force, repetition, and vibration risk factors. It takes about 10 minutes to complete a full assessment of a task using this tool. And so it's ideal for comparing the effect on risk of altering control location. It's pen and paper based, so it's ideal for use in the field. It requires very little time to master. And most importantly, it involves the user in the risk assessment process. The UK Health and Safety Executive actually provides free online access to a full description of the QEC including a section showing how these questions can be interpreted. There's a couple of pages from that online document. And the, I think that uh, we, what we didn't send you was the uh, link to this, this PDF, so we'll find a, find a way of getting that uh, to you. Um, but I, I will come back and leave this, this link up at the end of the presentation if you want to make a note of that. You can also get to that through the, uh, the link that you were provided to the QEC tool itself. Um, this covers some of the, the definitions of terms that we've used in this presentation. Um, obviously, I'll review those at your leisure uh, later on. I'm not going to go through them all now. Um, there's a couple of very good articles uh, addressing AT hand control design available through the universities of Tennessee and Wisconsin and uh, those are the links and information there again you should be able to access those or to jot them down um, from looking at the archived uh, copy of this this presentation and finally these are the references which you've already been sent and uh, before we take any questions I'm gonna hand you back to Paul Jones um, who's going to
Okay, I apologize for that brief delay. We are now going to move into our question and answer period. We have a, uh, an 800 number. If you have uh, questions you'd like to ask verbally, um, we're trying to get that activated right now. And while we're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and do our poll questions. And the first poll question. Simply asks about your professional affiliation. If you could go ahead and uh, tell us what type of organization you work with, we would appreciate that. Okay, thank you very much for filling that out. Our next poll question. Asks about the information that was shared today. The information presented during this session was valuable and met my expectations. Please indicate your preference on that. All right, thank you for your participation on that one. Our next poll has to do with the technology of this session. Technology used in this session was effective and usable. Give you just another couple seconds for that one. All right, and our final poll question for today based on today's session. I would attend another session in this series. A couple more seconds on that one. Okay, at this point I'm going to turn it back over to Rob and Cliff. I know we have at least one question that has been uh, sent through the chat window and I will uh, let Rob deal with that and I will check to see if our phone line is working correctly and we'll open that line for you if it's not. Oh, uh, this is a question on uh, the hand controls and funding for the users. I have to say that's not <laughs> that's not really my uh, my field. I, I'm really involved in the ergonomic side of this and not in the economic side of this. Um, I'm wondering if uh, if anyone else might be able to to give that. Are the users able to provide input about the hand controls they will be using? Well, I mean, from an ergonomics point of view, you, you, you know, you would certainly expect that they would provide input about the hand controls that they're using. Um, they uh, should be very much involved in the, the uh, design of them. Um, and, 
in in a sense of of deciding that they need a hand control uh, plainly they need to be involved but they also need to know whether whether that hand control is going to work for them or not and uh, one now one of the the difficulties uh, that we have therefore is is that the nature of the way things are set up is that we do tend to focus on the needs of the individual user with with the disability so that if they are going to drive that process really what this seminar is about this webinar is is really is about saying do we need to also take into account uh, the needs of, of people that maybe we're not dealing with officially um, when we're looking at funding and coming up with that solution. I'm not sure if that answers uh, that question or not. Are consumers, the next question is, are consumers involved in the process of assessing and s installing hand controls? Well, obviously a, lo a lot of uh, uh, assistive technology takes place without ever coming through official channels. Um, it's very much in the, uh, the case of uh, somebody making a control to suit their own needs or uh, maybe getting a friend to fabricate something or a member of the family. Um, so from that point of view of certainly there is we would imagine there is quite a large uh, demand uh, out there for hand controls that we never get to see. Um, in terms of the installation of them that goes with that as well I mean uh, you know, very often we're, we're dealing with people who are used to doing things for themselves and they may well install them um, that may have safety implications to do with the, uh, the, the just the safety of the fabrication, whether uh, whether there are structural weaknesses, whether there are hazards uh, from a sudden failure or from uh, an unexpected response from a hand control. So I think that although consumers uh, can be very much involved in that process, um, it is something where uh, we really need to be able to provide some, some backup and insight and very often that will take place, uh, ideally it would take place um, during the design of the hand controls and the selection of them but very often it's going to happen when we go along and see a dangerous hand control already in situ or a dangerous situation that's already arisen where, where it may be much harder uh, for us to be suggesting a change in that circumstance. Okay. Um, if people want to call in any questions, um, we've got the line open for calling in questions. If anyone uh, would like to do that, you're very welcome. I'm going to put up the uh, link to the QEC at the end of uh, the presentation so that you can actually go to finding out a lot more about that tool. Uh, that's something I've been using since uh, about 2002 and it's extremely useful for kind of quick risk evaluations of things like reach and force applications in the field. Um, we've got somebody, somebody raising their hand here. Um, let's see. Do, do I press the? Yeah. Hi. Um. Do you just want to go ahead and ask a question? I'm sorry. This is. Yes. Yes, I can hear you now. Sorry, it was very, it was very quiet at this end, but I can hear you on the, uh, on the, on the speakerphone now. It, what, what was your question? I've never heard of those. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that you're really going to find, um, uh, you know, uh, people in the uh, kind of in the yellow pages with this this type of thing. There are the the agribility um, site and the agribility uh, the the state and regional agribility projects uh, will be able to provide information now. And now I know in the case of uh, Ohio. Um, you really need to be uh, speaking with the. Uh, you're, presumably, you're not. Are, are you with the Agribility Office in Ohio? No, I'm actually at the Center for Independent Living in Ohio. Okay, all right. Um, so I, I would take as a starting uh, point if you want to know uh, the question here. Sorry for everyone else concerned here. Um, is is where we would find the. Um, the dealers or the people that actually fabricate these types of uh, assistive technology hand controls. So, so my suggestion would be that you you contact your um, state um, and regional agribility uh, center, um, and that's uh, in in the case of uh, Ohio, that's that's based out at OSU, and you can find the link to that on the uh, website, the www.agribility.org website and that will give you your local uh, access and those are really the people to start talking to. They will know uh, people uh, locally who are able to fabricate whose work um, they, they have seen in use and also uh, will be able to provide you with a lot of useful information um, that you're certainly going to need as part of that process. Is, is that of any use? Okay. Yeah, I, w I would start with www.agribility.org, and then and then uh, find your way there to the state and regional regional projects, and and uh, contact those uh, those good people out in Ohio. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 And, right, we've got a question up. Who pays for the hand controls? The employer and the user, etc. Again, the, these uh, my my apologies for this because these these aren't so much uh, questions that I tend to get terribly involved in. I'm I'm the ergonomist here. Um, uh, the the hand controls. Uh, I, I guess it depends, you know, what assistance you're getting from organisations like vocational rehabilitation. Um, if you're going to go, if you if you're going to require funding assistance for any of the adaptations that, that you're going to make, which is not only going to assist in terms of just the technical side of the hand controls, but it's also it's also going to um, really provide access to a lot of professionals that are going to be able to give you advice in all kinds of areas, including funding. Again, I, I would tend to um, start certainly either with uh, vocational rehabilitation, the state and regional agribility uh, projects. Uh, they will let you know the circumstances in which um, uh, payment is likely to be made, but it, it's quite important I understand um, to talk to them before you start going off and fabricating the hand controls or installing hand controls. Uh, I hear that it's a little bit more difficult to try and recoup any costs after the event. Um, but I say that that really isn't my particular area of involvement. Um, the uh, question, a good question came up. Uh, the, the yellow line for a better hand control, will it work in the rotation of the foot pedal? So, as, as you can imagine, what we're really looking uh, can I just uh, ask a technical question of the people here? Cliff, can I go back to, into the presentation just for a second and, and have a look at that and then come back to this? I'm going to go back to, uh, to answer that just to have a look at this particular uh, slide again when it comes up. Um, Let's get to this. There we go. So w what we're looking at here is this this dash yellow line, and you can see you kind of get a feel for where that pedal is going to go. Uh, it's going to tend to um, arc downwards towards uh, uh, towards uh, the left hand side, so that lever is going to move from right to left as you view it, and that would mean that the uh, the yellow line, which is just a, a an alternative, a possible alternative route, um, would then uh, start to uh, come up into uh, the leg space um, 
obviously this is uh, quite a complicated design it may may be a relatively simpler design uh, would be uh, would be suitable here something that was uh, maybe a curved in the opposite direction for example might might be the way instead of having an upward curve to the handle maybe even a downward curve to the handle would still actually um, allow the pedal to operate um, in that way um, I don't think the pedal the actual operation of the pedal is going to be affected because we're not talking about uh, linking that um, that yellow line lever we're not talking about attaching that to the floor in any way it this this really looks to me to be some something that really just requires a solution that actually doesn't put the um, the vertical the near vertical part of that that lever right into uh, the entrance and exit to to the seat the seated user's position I think we just need something that's going to be um, a little bit uh, cranked in a different way um, or uh, it might it might be that you need to consider some kind of some different kind of actuator there if that really isn't uh, a solution for it but I, I think that's that was just a, a kind of off-the-cuff sketch as to how we might allow emergency access to and from that area and it's really more of more of a an illustration of how we've got to try and think our way around these various requirements we don't want to we don't want to make the the clutch pedal usable and then create a safety hazard at the same time and that's what that was really all about and the simple fact is um, that's a line drawing on a on a slide and I've absolutely no idea without evaluating that whether that would even work or not um, it strikes me as as very complicated um, but really it's to show you the kind of thing that I have in mind in terms of these uh, emergency exits Okay, we've got a question. Is there a clearing house for adaptive components, cylinders, etc.? Uh, it's a telecaller. John John Zeller is on online. Um, now I know that um, there's increasing interest. Uh, I know um, from the national training workshop in Michigan uh, last year. I saw a, a, a really a neat presentation uh, by Wisconsin that was that was talking about uh, maybe uh, having some reuse of some assistive technology. Um, I'm not, I'm not too sure at this moment in time whether there's there's really anything of of that kind going. And I know John uh, John Zeller from the conversation that I've had uh, that that I've had online with you before, John, that you're really interested in in um, kind of having some kind of central source for people who want to fabricate these things. I'm not aware of any. I'm not sure if anyone else is aware of anything. There's a central resource for the typical types of components that we need in, in uh, assistive technology, for example, hand controls. I'm just not aware of anything like that. I think it's very much a case of looking for the part maybe out on the internet or speaking to your local uh, um, fabricators and, and them coming up with uh, solutions with you, particularly if they have a lot of experience of working with assistive technology. This question is, do I have any statistics on the, um, the number or percent of secondary injuries resulting from the use of AT hand controls? That would be uh, very much something that uh, I, I Certainly, there would be some statistics um, in presumably in the work that uh, both Therese Wilcom uh, and uh, Sam Matthew um, had done. I don't have those statistics to hand. If if you um, are seriously interested in those, um, then I'm very happy to find those out for you by a simple reference to the papers that I have access to here, and I can I can put that information out to to you uh, with pleasure. Either if you want to want to drop us a line by email or if you want to give us a call then uh, once I've got your your uh, details I'll actually get that information to you. Um, we've got time for one more question. The question is since Agribility doesn't provide funding for this type of assistive technology besides technical assistance with assessments what services does Agribility provide? <laughs> uh, well, Agribility uh, certainly provides um, uh, training assistance. Um, it provides um, 
doc uh, documents that are uh, helpful in terms of um, coming up with possible solutions um, for, for people with disabilities working in the agricultural sector. I think the best place to start with uh, looking at um, what Agrability does, what it's all about, rather than in, in this short time me providing anything kind of an overview which is which is certainly going to be very sparse in terms of what it does, I would urge you to go to um, agrability.org and that will explain a lot more about the range of services that Agrability off offers. It's certainly not just a matter of providing um, uh, technical information, there's, there's all kinds of uh, guidance that's there including uh, guidance towards uh, funding resources, uh, putting, putting people in touch with the right people is, is part of what the, the scheme is about. Um, I've just been, been uh, told that I can, if there's any uh, short questions I can answer uh, a couple of short ones. Um, this question is, what if the user is not a, a vocational rehab client, for example, if they're part of the migrant worker population? I'm working in California, so this is why I'm asking these questions. Well, um, as far as agribility is concerned, we don't draw any distinction in terms of uh, providing assistance. We don't ask any, uh, any uh, questions uh, that would affect uh, the access that anyone had to agribility um, work. So um, I think um, the answer to that is, it, from our point of view, it doesn't really make any difference whether somebody is a VR client or not a VR client. That's an issue between uh, vocational rehab and the client, not between agribility and the client. You know, our role is really uh, assisting um, anyone working in the agricultural sector who has a disability. And uh, we're not, um, we're, we're just not looking at that side of things. We're just looking at the disability side. And just one more if we have one. Okay. All right. Um, I'd like to say thank you for uh, joining us today. Um, I hope you found it useful. And if uh, you have any other uh, questions, please get in touch with us through agrability.org. And uh, we'll be glad to um, not only answer your questions, but share those, share our responses with others who participated as well. Thanks very much.